So with that first presentation, Mr. City Manager. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem, members of the council. Uh, first item tonight is a presentation on combustion turbine, the H5 repair. This was the item that the council had a, a reading of last week, asked to hold it a couple of weeks, and then bring it forward to this study session tonight. Uh, so our Independence Power and Light Director, Jim Nail, uh, has some additional information that we hope gets to the questions the council had. Um, but if others come up, we'll continue to, to work on that. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to Jim. Evening, Mayor Pro Tem, Council Members, Jim Nail, Director of Power and Light. Uh, just as a follow-up on the questions that were from the Council meeting last week, um, we have this presentation on our combustion turbine options. Uh, just to, uh, to kick it off, just a, a, an update for you on where we are. We've been... We've been discussing uh, the uh, future replacement of the combustion turbines for several months now. Uh, and just to give you an update on where we're at, um, for the past year, staff has been doing research on potential technologies that we could pursue. Uh, we've had discussions with Southwest Power Pool on their generation replacement process. Um, they're in progress right now is a siting study, which is uh, an engineering firm who's doing evaluations of the uh, possible locations where we could place new generation, look at the, the locations, any limitations, suitable technologies that would be best suited for those locations. Uh, their report is expected uh, at the end of this month, and then they would, from there, then they would pursue uh, or start working on a, a draft of an RFP uh, to go out and request proposals for those, those technologies. We have filed a generation replacement request with Southwest Power Pool. Uh, the deadline in order to in order to minimize the number of waivers we had to ask for the deadline to get that in was July 1st so we went ahead and submitted a request to SPP uh, in parallel with that we filed a waiver request for with FERC uh, to waive certain terms certain language in the mm -hmm. uh, Southwest Power Pool um, protocols which stipulated that you had to have you had to have a request in prior to the unit being shut down um, in order to take advantage of that, that fast track process. So both of those are, are in, the, in the system now and we're waiting on feedback from both FERC and Southwest Power Pool. Um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the RFP development, that's planned to work through the, through the summer here and be ready to release in September. Most recently what's happened is we've developed a fault on, as we reported last week, on uh, CTH5 uh, generator, a uh, fault in the, in the generator itself. Uh, H5 is one of our two gas turbines that's, at, that's most frequently called on by Southwest Power Pool because they, it's one of the two that runs on natural gas. Um, the fault in the generator section, uh, essentially that, that prevent, prevents the generator from producing electricity. The turbine works, the generator will spin, but no, out, no output because of this fault. Um, the generator itself, that turbine is ma was manufactured and has been serviced over the years by General Electric, and uh, General Electric has provided us a proposal in order to repair it and return it to service. That was the proposal that was put before the council last week. Um, the GE 5000 series combustion turbine, uh, here's a picture of the, the turbine end of it. Uh, you'll see the multiple rows of uh, the compressor blades which pull the air in and then when it's fired the two larger rings at the right hand side that's where the the hot gases go through and propel the, the turbine um, that's not the piece where this problem is our, our problem on h5 is in the generator this is the rotor portion of the generator it's a very large chunk of metal with copper windings uh, wound around it and slotted through it. Somewhere in there is the fault, which prevents the electricity to, from flowing. Um, we have several options in front of us. One would be to repair the generator. Uh, repairing it would enable us to maintain our ability to participate in uh, generation opportunities with Southwest Power Pool. Uh, it would continue to meet the capacity obligation that we have with Southwest Power Pool. Another alternative would be to replace it, which uh, part of what we've been studying for the, the past year is the options to replace it. And there, there's multiple options there. All of them have a rather, all of them have a lengthy timeline on them, a multi-year path. 
between replacing and repairing, the third option would be to just retire. Decide that we've spent enough money on this unit and it's time to let it go. Um, downside of that is that we, don't, we no longer have excess capacity. So any capacity that we retire, we have to replace. And so we would have to go out for capacity contracts of one form or another to meet that capacity obligation to Southwest Power Pool. Next several slides, we're gonna take a look at what these options are and some of the, some of the pluses and minuses that would go into your decision. As I said, if we, if we retire the unit, if we decide that it's not worth repairing, that it's not worth the added expense, um, we would make the decision to retire the unit. H5 supplies 17 megawatts of our obligated capacity. Uh, that capacity, that same capacity from our current Oneta contract would be approximately 500,000 a year, but any addition we make to the Oneta contract is for the life of the contract, which goes to 2030. So $500,000 a year for the next seven years, um, we would have, we would be, uh, in order to take advantage of that addition in the contract. We did ask um, Tanaska, our marketing partner, we asked Tanaska to go out and, and see if we had to go shop for capacity now, what kind of capacity contracts are available out there? Uh, so right now the average on the market is about $600,000 a year plus the transmission costs that would be added on top of that. Um, the $500,000 a year in Oneta already includes the capacity from that, from that uh, transaction. It was also su suggested that instead of capacity, let's get capacity plus the energy so that we would have the energy uh, available to us as well. Current market prices for that 17 megawatts over the course of a year with a, with a contract to guarantee it would run anywhere from 2.3 to 2.7 million per year for, at pl again, plus the transmission costs to uh, get it from wherever the source is to independence. The other thing is that once we decide that we're retiring the unit, it would no longer qualify for SPP's fast track uh, study process. Uh, we are requesting the exemption right now for uh, on our Blue Valley site simply because they announced it after, right after we retired it, our, our, our waiver request is based on the fact that if they had made that known to us while they were releasing that option, we could, we could have done things differently. Now that we know that that's the process, if we retire a unit, we would no longer have justification to request a waiver. It would be, it, we would simply drop into the long four to five year process for uh, generation interconnection studies. Excuse me, Mr. Neal, I'm sure I missed it, but how much did you say the transmission costs are? We I have don't no know. idea. Oh, it don't. would depend on where it comes from. It depending on who we were able to get a contract with, uh, SPP would take okay. a look at the transmission, the, what that would do to the transmission load already between us and that source, and they would evaluate uh, the additional transmission costs based on that. So it would, all, it would depend entirely on where uh, the capacity and energy is purchased from. Thank you, sorry to interrupt. No, quite all right. If we decide to replace H5, um, we have to go through Southwest Power Pool's generation interconnection request. Um, any new addition to Southwest Power Pool, uh, whether that's transmission or generation, they go through a very intense engineering review process to make sure it's not gonna place other stresses on the network. Um, if we use their, if we qualify for their replacement study process, then that's about a 12 to 18 month timeline uh, to get their approval uh, to connect the equipment. If it's not in service and it doesn't qualify, right now SPP's interconnection request is running about four to five years for them to get the study done. Um, there's another downside is that the normal, the normal review process they will take a whole set of proposals, whether it's, whether it's a, a wind farm in the middle of Kansas, another generator in Nebraska, somebody else down in, in Oklahoma. They take all those requests, lump them together, and as they study the impact of that generation and trans, of those generation changes, everybody in that study shares in the transmission costs that have to be developed. So even though 
even though we might put a generation at a site that we absolutely know requires no changes to the transmission system, we would still share in that aggregate cost if we're in the normal four to five year study process. So again, and those transmission costs, we wouldn't know until we get through the study. With replacement, um, EIA, uh, right now their, their estimates for uh, the capital costs of new generation start at about 1.1 million per megawatt and go up from there depending on the type of technology and the size. Um, obviously, the bigger you go, you get some economies of scale, but in, in the neighborhood that we would most likely be dealing, it's around uh, 1 to 1.1 million dollars per megawatt uh, for your installed capital costs. The time frame, we have the, not only do we have the Southwest Power Pool permit process to go through, but we also have the environmental process, which can take 12 to 18 months to get an answer back on uh, the environmental permits. Again, it depends on the size of the generation, the type of the generation, what type of, of fuel, what type of emissions, all that has goes into play. But could, once you get those approvals, then to complete the engineering design work, the uh, structural engineering, ob obtain all the parts and pieces and get it in operation. Optimistically, you're looking at at least three years uh, from, the, from the time you decide to pull the trigger to where we actually have generation in place. And during that three years, you're still gonna have to replace the capacity. So in addition to the cost of the, of the new equipment, uh, you have the capacity requirement um, if H5 is not in operation. The third option would be to repair the unit. The proposal that we received from GE was for a, a maximum of 1.9 million. That included a number of different contingencies. Uh, the, the most cost effective way to research the fault, identify it, and determine what repairs are needed is to actually send the unit to GE. In order to do it on site, they would have to ship in a lot of specialized equipment some tenting to surround the unit with before they take the shrouds off and expose it to the environment. Um, more efficient to just send it to them, let them do it. Once they get it there, um, these machines, they have not only they have that big chunk of metal that I showed you, there's end caps on there that may or may not be, they may be fine. If they're in good shape, you don't have to reuse them. The copper that's wound through the, through the rotor, if they can find a specific fault, and that's repairable, then the rest of the copper can stay and, and be reused. The 1.9 million assumes they have to replace everything, um, the, the cost to do that. And it also includes, that also includes uh, moving some equipment around here on our end um, while, the, while that rotor's out for repair. It could be much less. We won't know that until such time as the, uh, the rotor's actually examined by GE and they can determine what the repair is. To give you some more expertise on that and to explain what their process is, we invited GE to come in and be here tonight to give an explanation of what it is they do and to answer your questions. I've got two representatives from General Electric here tonight. I'll let them introduce themselves and hope to answer whatever questions you have. Uh, good evening, my name is Blair Van Dyne. I'm the district director for G's gas power business. And I'm open to any questions you have. What is it specifically you do for GE? Uh, I, I manage uh, the East District uh, from Kansas, Missouri, down to Arkansas and Oklahoma Doing in what? Texas. Uh, sales and service. Sales and service? Yes. Sales and service, we have approximately 300 units in that territory. Mm -hmm. And on a on the generation side, so I manage a group of people that perform sales and service on those units. Sales and service, kind of a wide variety here. So we sell new At units, you service <coughs> this no, side. No, what, what, what is aftermarket your sales and service only. Okay, what is your expertise? Is it in the sales side or is it in the service side? I have a background in engineering. I was a field engineer. Um, I, I've done work on all six units at the city, uh, J1, J2 through H5 and H6. Okay. doing intros, I'll do mine. I'm Tom Freeman. I live in Atlanta. 
and I am the chief customer consultant, whatever that means. Uh, I was the head of services engineering for um, about 10 or 12 years um, in Atlanta, and um, had I owned all about 5,000 gas turbines for GE around the world. So I'm the I'm the techie for this one, and I'll as it goes along here, I'll field any questions you guys have in that space. Gentlemen, <coughs> Dan Hobart here. Uh, Mr. Nell mentioned that you could, if we decide to repair this unit, you can do it on site or send it to GE. What if we send it to you? What's that look like generally? So we would pull the generator field from the unit, put it on a truck, and ship it to Atlanta. We have a generator shop in Atlanta where we have a environmentally controlled space where we would do the work. Um, we have a process to ensure that there's not contamination brought into the space. We call it a clean room. And it's, it's the most effective place to do generator work is in the shop, mm -hmm. not on site. Gotcha. Um, would it even be effective if you did it here? I mean, if you're going from a clean room to... We, we mainly reserve the option to do a rewind on site for extremely large units such as a nuclear field where it is cost ineffective to ship or impossible. Um, of all the field rewinds that I've been a part of with GE, we've done all of them in the shop. Okay. Okay. Explain to him some of the data you gave us about the expected lifespan. Sure. So our frame three and five fleet worldwide is a little over 3,000 units still in operation out of approximately 5,000 units built. It is our largest fleet of gas servants. Um, we have maintenance recommendations that we provide um, via a, a document online. Uh, it's accessible to the public. It's called GER 3620. We have recommended fired starts and fired hours for each of our units. For these frame fives, the, the expectation prior to a life inspection to be done on the rotor is 5,000 starts and 200,000 hours. It's typically done either on starts or hours. These units are hours are starts based. H5, H5 averaged about 140 starts per year over the last three years. The, uh, H5 has 2,825 starts as of today. So on life, before a life extension um, inspection would be done is you know, over 2,000 starts. So that's, that's quite a bit of, of life. And H6 is a similar vintage. Uh, they have 2,615 fired starts. You know, now that we've got you here, <laughs> Since you mentioned that, we did a, a study or some inspections some time back that said that we had five to ten years left of life on our turbines, and now that's down to three to eight. Uh, what you're talking about, these fired starts, does that give you any indication? Because you said roughly it's a little over halfway to the starts before you do a life extending inspection. Mm -hmm. How does that fit together? Is that any kind of indicator we can rely on or no? I mean, ultimately, you can maintain these units for another 100 years. It just, at some point in time, you have to make a decision, is it worth my investment to keep the units operational or is it not? And there's got to be a point there, I assume, that the council is going to have to make a decision of what amount of money is too much to maintain the units. I'll give you some different context on this. So gas turbines are, 1949 was the first gas turbines. There's a unit from November of 1953 that I work on on and off uh, just a few months ago again. Um, it's still running. It's over 500,000 hours. It still hasn't made it to 100 starts. They turn it on and they run and run and run and run and run. And, um, and so you have that context. You have another context with New Orleans Water and Sewage Board. With the, they're the turbine that sits behind, which is a, similar to a frame five, that sits behind the levee um, with 90 pumps attached to it. Um, they're in the same type of space. It really becomes, so there's a lot of units with a lot of hours out there that still run and will still go for a while. 
The context for that would be steam turbines. I think the oldest steam turbine I worked on was maybe 10 years ago, in 19, or an 1896 steam turbine at a, um, at a, a lumberjack camp in, in California. So these things are gonna go a long ways, it's just maintenance. The challenge when we get to the threes and fives is they're so far, they're so far, they're, many of them aren't running long hours, they're doing standby roles. If I, we were talking Exxon or Chevron, yes, they're running an hours-based regime. The, the, what we run into on the parts is that the hours and starts sometimes become less meaningful than this is a piece of metal sitting here rusting, and it's sitting a lot. And so the maintenance shifts there, and then the, then the supply chain element of if we have to replace a part, is that part, like for instance, that steam turbine, that is a wood bearing. Um, there's nobody making wood bearings. Um, and uh, so we had to, we have to adjust to what are we gonna do today. So, um, so this, as we look at this, is we could see this unit, these units going a long time. And we get the, exactly the interplay here is where is it, where is there, is there a break <coughs> where it becomes appropriate with everything else going on, not just at the plant, but in the grid itself, everything that's happening in the world right now and in the US grid space, is it appropriate to consider retirement of some, and that's why, that's why he gave you those three options. Where, where's that dividing line, and how can we best support the city, the state, the, the region with that? Um, so I don't know if that gives a little more context I, to. I don't know. Go ahead, um, So in your um, estimation, uh, have you looked at this turbine, or you're familiar with it at least? Yes, I'm familiar with uh, H5 and H6. Okay, so is it your opinion that we should repair it? Does that make sense mechanically and this unit's worth repairing? Uh, well, uh, it, I think I paid yeah. like Yes, uh, in my opinion, uh, the city has uh, the latest uh, control uh, system yeah. that GE makes. You yeah, have the latest I excitation sure system that like GE makes. We did our last major inspection on this unit in 2018. So if you get the generator operational, you have another five years before you have to do an, another inspection. So that's five years of operation. Um, now there is a cost to doing, pulling the generator field, having the shop look at it. Right. We can certainly pull the generator field, have the shop look at it, and then the council can make a decision on the path forward once we have a better understanding of the condition. Okay, sorry. What kind of increased efficiency are we talking about? just on a repair. What's that? What kind of increased efficiency? I heard a lot of words being described in the process. Do, do our repairs see an increased efficiency to repair it and put it back into service? No, there's no efficiency gains and by. When we, and so now we've got this, we've got people that think about the environment and, and how much we're spending uh, in terms of gas use doesn't make a lot of sense, does it, to just keep throwing money at old units that aren't efficient to begin with? Well, they, you don't, you they don't weren't pay built to for be gas. Efficient, right? You're not so paying for gas. Efficiency is an important element, though, right? Um, by, by what standard? Well, I, they don't run for free. That's true. Okay, but so how are we improving efficiency when we run the unit? The efficiency is not gained in the generator. It's gained in the combustion turbine. Okay. So is there a gain or a loss? Uh, we, we haven't proposed doing any work on the combustion turbine. Mm -hmm. So no, there would not be a change in efficiency. Okay, so is it, if by today's standards, is that one of the more efficient systems or can we improve the way it operates and the efficiency of the operation of the unit? With, I mean, newer, with newer yeah, units? Absol absolutely, okay. there, we make gas turbines today that are 64% efficient. That's what, that's what I'm trying to get. Absolutely, is that, absolutely. You know, because there's more than just, let's just throw two million at it and run it for five more years. There's, there's long-term effects of what, what sure. we're trying to decide here. Sure, no, so I, 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 I'm I, not particularly interested in what, what's best for us in five years. I'm looking at 20 years, looking at two, three generations down the road. What's best for the rate payers in this city? There's, there's certainly units today that have much lower emissions and run much more efficiently. And I'd like to hear more about that. 
Sure. At I'm some not. point. You don't yeah, have absolutely. to tonight. I know that wasn't, but I, I'd still like to hear that. <laughs> but, but, and that is that's one of the things I've <clears throat> talked with your team on is that, is if, if, it, if a decision was to make a move, what would, what would it be? How many megawatts do you put on the ground? You're not going to put a H or J, a GEH or a Siemens or, or, um, or um, MHIJ. It's just too big. Um, that doesn't make sense. But then what? There's aeroderivative units that are airplane units put on trucks or on on the ground. There's um, there's reciprocating engines. You know, a John Deere sitting on the uh, side. There's um, there's other sizes of heavy-duty gas turbines that are possible. So the range can go from, in a combined cycle plant, can go from, say, 50% to 64 mm -hmm. in the heavy-duty space, mm -hmm. and the aero machines are up another 10 from there. So, so you would, if it was efficiency there, but you're going to want to talk about efficiency beyond fuel efficiency, you're also going to want to talk about carbon efficiency. Sure. And you're going to want to talk, what can I use other fuels? So the thing about the fives are, the fives are really robust. You can, you, they're very hard to hurt. Um, and so they can do, they can, they're not as finicky in some ways as the newer units, right? It's the difference between the old car you have in your garage and the new one you have. You've got to take the new one to somebody to go do it, and you're still working on your old Corvette. So that's kind of what's happening here um, and what we so we can see we we're looking at all these pieces and trying to give guidance with that uh, and get and giving it as industry guidance not as this is what GE wants you to do um, so um, so yeah there's a there's a lot of nuance to that so the question is when I, the question I would have is on the on the this generator am I gonna have to do more generators Okay, so how do what am, what's what's the look ahead? Right. On these three units, I don't really run them. So, do I retire a set of units? Do I can I move parts between the sites to keep my asset management costs down and position me for a little later? So, th there's a lot of pieces of this. We can go way longer than anybody in this room wants an engineer to go. <laughs> so that would be a terrible thing for you to just let me keep talking. My wife will tell you I can suck the air out of any room. I think you're doing a fine job. You're giving <laughs> us an education here, and that's what we were asking for. I mean, we've had the the, the, run, the problem we've run into is we've had generate our um, councils in the past that have just kind of kicked it down to this council, and we're trying to look at what's best for the city. Spend two million on an old unit, and that's old. No doubt. We have done a <coughs> generator engineering study on. I3, I4, H5, and H6, mm -hmm. and all three of those fields will fit into H5. Uh, it's similar design, uh, same length. So in the event that you did find an issue on H5, which made the field unrepairable in your estimation based on cost, then you can certainly swap a field from another unit that's not operating. That's the thing with that, so these are all sister <laughs> units, basically. Around the same era, they're all 5,000. Era, yeah, I think <coughs> the early ones were 18 megawatt units, the later ones are probably around 30 megawatts, yeah. I3 through, I, through H5 are sequential serial numbers. H6 is a different vintage, and J's are different vintages. Mm. I, I, flip back to, I flip back to his page here, because I think it's important. The, the question on going to new is, it's the timing of the permitting and everything. Could you speak a little bit louder uh, yes. than the mic? Sorry. Thanks very much. Yep. It, the, t the timing, the, 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 what's this page here, I thought when he put this up, was an important page. The cost of generation in the smaller scale is important. He's tried to capture what he's got for that. But also the permitting piece. So I know, for instance, that I have a truck-mounted unit. It's an aeroderivative unit that could be running in 14 days technically, but you've got hoops to get through. So, um, and th that's, the, that's really the big question is how, getting through the permitting and getting through the work with SPP and, uh, and in the state in general with the, EP, you know, the DEP type stuff. So, um, so those are really the questions on how does this lay together if we were to go do something different. 
right? Um, there are, um, I can't see the who, one of you asked a question about efficiency. We could do things to the units to make them more efficient, but it's gonna be incremental little numbers, and I don't see the point of spending that kind of money. These are making the megawatts for you, and we're sitting in a world of U.S. gas prices are so low, and you, I think it's a pass-through for you anyway, but just as a citizen of the world, it's nicer to be efficient, but it doesn't make a lot of sense in, the, uh, you know, in terms of this unit is doing its doing the duty it needs to do. It's not running a lot of hours. It's not accumulating a ton of carbon uh, footprint. I understand that, I, but the unit is old. It's aged. Sure. So how long do we continue to have this path? That's really what we're wrestling we with. Yep, we understand. I mean, what's, what's financially responsible? Is it going to be cheaper tomorrow to, to replace it than it was yesterday? The answer is no. It's always cheaper right now in the moment to consider the options. Yep. Um, and weigh them against cost and uh, what's best for our longevity. And the longer we push this off, the bigger the bill's going to be. G's not going to get cheaper. You're not the cheapest guys in town, and you won't be the cheapest guys in town in 10 years or five years or three years. The, the fact is we're going to pay, and we're going to pay something for the replacement. Yep. The issue is, since everybody's worried about money and investment, is it cheaper to do it today versus three years down the road or five years down the road? You can help as an engineer, I'm sure you're good with numbers, say, yeah, it will be cheaper in the moment to now to do something in that regard than wait three or five or 10 years down the road. Yeah, I, I don't care if they run 10 years, it's still gonna cost us a heap of money and it'll cost us more than tonight. Uh, yeah, I would say seemingly with the numbers that he's shown you is with the capacity outlay, it's probably best to repair this one, but know that the next one is, you're gonna be, right? You're gonna be, you're gonna be at a place where you're against the wall, and if you can start the process, you'd wanna right. repair this one and start the process on the replacement. Right. And that's one of my biggest issues, you know, we have a lot of liability out there. We're not getting a lot of money back. Uh, you know, things only bring, I think, was it last year, Mr. City Manager, 275,000. We got a lot of liability out there. Um, and I don't think anybody up here doesn't think that we need to replace them. It's, and, and I appreciate what you're saying, and maybe we need to repair this, and we also have that other one sitting up there that's, uh, they just didn't walk by, you know, there's some blade issues up there, so now we're talking more about, you know what I'm saying, and they're all, we just, we gotta figure out a game plan, and I really appreciate you guys coming out, because, you know, we, all of us, I think, know that we got to replace these, and so that's, that's the biggest deal. If, um, you know, the, uh, I say keep throwing money at this thing. <clears throat> I've been up here three years. I know John and, and Councilman Delucci, and Councilman Delucci's been up here quite a while and has seen all this money go out there. But and we understand in order to stay in business, you have to spend money. There's no doubt about that. But we're to a turning point where we're really needing <coughs> experts to come here and figure out a game plan here, a path that we can follow because this is not going to get it. I mean, we're sitting out here. <clears throat> Every time you crack one open, 1 1.5 to $2 million. I mean, that's all there is to it. And so, you know, we got 12 million sitting here that we're playing with that these ratepayers just, you know, they're wanting something too, I'm sure, you know, for their money. But I, you know, if that's your mm -hmm. opinion that we need to repair these uh, or this one, uh, we said that on the last one, of course. <laughs> we're not going to do another one, but I uh, appreciate that. Do you want to jump back? Sure. And I think the point of the presentation, um, Councilman, is that it's, it's not either or, it's and. Um, because of the timeline, if we decide today that we are pursuing, if we issued an RFP tomorrow, you're still looking at most likely three years before you'll have that new generation. And in that three years, you still have to pay for the capacity that we've lost from H5. So it's an, it's an and solution that we're asking for. Um, that we repair H5, that we pursue, continue pursuing the new generation and get that plan in motion so that we have the generation on hand, the new generation on hand to carry us forward. Um, as a summary, putting all these on the same page, the repair is going to be 1.9 million is the worst case estimate that we've been given uh, based on uh, GE's expertise on the repair of these units. 
retiring, saying we're not, we're not going to put any more money into it, we're going to let it go, shut it down, 500000 a year minimum to replace the capacity. If we have to go out on the market, then it's possibly 600000 plus transmission during that three-year period. Uh, so you could spend as much as $3.5 million just on capacity in the time that it takes us to replace that unit. Uh, replacement, again, multiple scenarios are being looked at right now. We do have options. You're right, these, this decision has been delayed for years, um, and we need to get something going. But any solution to replacement is going to take time. Um, did, did these guys, did you guys inspect six also? Yes. What's, what's your theory on it, if you would? Um, what did it look like to you? I mean, we don't have to run it. We can run everything but that one to keep it so we have the capacity, I guess. <laughs> Essentially, with six, all you have are bad first-stage blades, which you can replace without pulling the rotor. It's a, it would be a low cost to the city. It's about $300,000. You've already yeah, I'm sorry. It's about $300,000 $300, to get H6 operational. Yeah, I just didn't want to see it, uh, you know, spin and do a lot more damage out there. Yeah, we've, we did a major inspection on H6, I believe, in 2018 as well, and we tested the generator recently. So the generator, as far as we can tell, based on testing standards, are, is good. And the gas turbine, as far as we can tell, based on recent boroscopes minus the first stage issue, is good to operate. So on the 6, H6, with the blade issue, mm -hmm. Did you is did you move the test uh, the trip points or how I mean how did it come about that if we had a problem there I mean was that an inspection by you guys or yeah we did a boroscope inspection and that boroscope inspection was sent to our our, our compressor engineering team who reviewed the damage and determined that the unit could continue operation now certainly that risk is borne by the city. Um, in the event that there was a failure. And if there was a failure with the first stage and it went downstream, then that's, that's a bad day. <laughs> <laughs> Real bad day. <laughs> so so I, I understand that the city has some hesitation with running in the current condition. That's, I'm glad to hear that. Yeah, I, yeah I wanna, I'm glad you said that. I, so from the, from the engineer's perspective in the product service organization, the way they, 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 that was the team I was in, we would have, we would have made that judgment. They made they made a judgment to say these it's ice damage, they're they're dinged. You can continue running. The con I don't know the precise length they were thinking, but they generally think about that as oh you can get to the fall outage. Well you you're not looking at a fall outage. You're looking at you're you, I don't I think if we went back and said hey guys we what if you what if I told you I want to do this for five more years they would say stop. So I you you're probably going to pull those blades. The nice thing is those blades slide out the front so you don't have to pull anything you, uh, and lift the you know up and out so they're easy to replace that part is easy to replace and um, and you can get that back up and clean quickly how, did did we ever find out how they were damaged I, I it looks like icing damage uh, so oh, okay. what happened they're yeah, exposed ch chunks of ice yeah it, it, it accumulates in a vice and then pulling ice in breaking off and pulling in and bouncing off blades. So yeah. to be clear for everyone, it's, it's 1.9 for one unit and a potential 300,000 for the other. So we're at 2.2. Well, it's up to 1.9. 2.2. Right, I mean, the, the 1.9 includes <coughs> the opening of the units, the transportation to the shop, pulling the rings off, replacing it with new copper, taking a field from I and bringing it over to H, and replacing the retaining rings. So that's an absolute worst case scenario. So you are looking at 1.9, basically. I mean, that scenario. Yeah, that scenario is is what we estimate as the I highest. Mean, you wouldn't take it down there and not rebuild it. Surely, you're not going to ship it down there and not replace the rings and do. Well, the, the, I mean, what I'm saying is, if you're not going to do it a 1.2 million dollar job when you can do a 1.9 and bring it back as as new as you can get. It's what you know. Rebuild. No, our our recommendation is purely technical. You're welcome to come to the shop. Anybody from the city is welcome to no, come no, to the shop. No, no, I'm not, I'm not, I'm just saying that uh, we're throwing out there, maybe it could be 500,000, might be yeah. 900,000. What I'm saying is if you're going to take this thing all the way to Georgia, you're going to bring it back. You're going to spend 1.9 million and make it top shelf. 
Only if it's necessary. Only, yeah, I would say no. Okay. Uh, what we would do is if we could if we could reuse the copper. I mean, you think about that thing right there. I'll tell you what that is. That's the that's the engine on the bottom of a slot car when you were a child. That's what that is. Just a little bigger. And if you can a take little that bigger. little copper, yeah, you can take that little <laughs> copper. Yeah. You can take that. It's the one you wish you had. Um, that's, you're right. The if you could take that wire and reuse that wire, if we can find that where that fault where that fault is coming from, and we can reuse most all most of the wire, you know. If we can do that, then that portion of it comes off. Anything we can avoid doing, we're going to avoid doing. Well, it's yeah. about turning it around, uh, right? The whole key here is to turn it around and get it running. So it just depends on where in the copper the damage is. It really depends on if we can clear the fault. So if we clear pull the, the rings fault. off, clean mm -hmm. it, and we retest it and it tests fine, then in our opinion, it's good to go. Yeah. Okay. I have one more question again since you're here. Uh, and maybe Mr. Nail, I don't, there's a, the, one of the slides says that new generation has 1.1 million per megawatt. You mentioned, Mr. Engineer, uh, earlier, there was, for a smaller scale, it, what, is that what the 1.1 megawatt per, uh, 1.1 million per megawatt is? What, 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 what sort of sizes would that cover? Uh, given that I'm Mr. Engineer, that I'm the wrong guy to ask dollar <laughs> questions to, because I don't, I purposely try not to follow that because then I lose all credibility. Gotcha. So, um, all right. But I don't. He can tell you where that came from. I kind of know. I know numbers on a bigger scale, roughly where they are in terms of people trading out power plants in Texas or something. But um, that's. I mean, that's that's really the can question you, is. Well, if you know that number or somebody else knows it better and you well, rather well, say it. You fill in what you got because I well, know what you have. When you start talking about combined cycle plants or supercritical coal plants, boiler plants, when you start talking about plants up in the six, seven hundred megawatt, 1,200 megawatt, now you're dropping down into the 0 0.8 million, 0 0.7 okay. million instead of the 1.1. 1 .1. I got you. Uh, when you're down in the 200 and below, uh, then you're looking at, at the like 1.1 to 1.4 per megawatt. Okay. So are you guys, are, are you replacing any plants right now? Are you building any gas plants or coal plants anywhere? What's, what's one you're working on and how big is it and what's it costing? The, the new ones, I'll give him the second question. The new ones are seven HAs, they're very large, they're huge in the gigawatt space. Um, okay. And there are there's several of them being built. There are probably 60 more coming in the U.S. Um, the frame size that we made the most of last year in terms of units that we shipped to sites to install was the 70A, which is 80 megawatts. Right now, the way this year is going, the aero units, the aero derivative units, it's kind of the area I was talking about, is right now vastly leading as people use those to displace coal. And um, so if you would have asked us, if you would ask me, not GE, this is going to be me, a few years back, uh, we all thought that when a the H's and the J's came, that it was going to displace and eliminate the frame fives and the B's and E's. It's done the opposite. First of all, they're not doing what we thought and running exactly like coal with a bunch of power always on. They're bouncing around too. And what's happened is the fives and the Bs and the Es, and this is really part of his point, the fives, the Bs, and the Es are fully depreciated, grandfathered and permit, and they're turning out that people are spending money all over to keep them running longer and longer and longer because we're in a transition, we're in an energy transition in the country and really in the world. We're in a transition. We can talk a lot about renewables and wind and solar and hydrogen and decarbonization and carbon capture and blah, blah, on and on. We can talk about it, but the technology, it's, it's a slow to move to that technology and it creates, um, you know, for the guys on the T and D side, it's messy because the, the, um, it's not a sure power. You know, the thing, in, the thing that happened in Texas happened at 3 a.m. Solar wasn't very helpful uh, and wouldn't have been, never will be. So, um, so, What's happening, and that's why the fives, that's why he said 100 years. Um, these could be really potent because for a long time. And, um, and you know, th th it's going to become a question of can I get the parts? 
can I, can I, you know, if I have to change equipment, how much does it cost? And there's going to be a dividing line for sure, but man, you can see these going a long time. So. And other places are making that decision because of the uncertainty or the changing energy market, um, energy sources. Y yes. Um, and? So uh, you can see that I can, I can give you a couple, I can think of a couple companies in the southeast that are making those changes, but at the same time we're seeing units that are replacing frame fives with frame fives. Um, because it fits right down on the footprint and they change nothing about the combustor so there's no permanent change. And they're just putting in a new 1980 Corolla on top of the old 1980 Corolla, right? So, um, so that, and that's kind of, so there, we, we are seeing a lot of flange to flange, you know, this, this guy, oh, no, no, no flange, but that whole turbine down the street here, wherever it was, um, that whole turbine where they unbolt from the inlet and exhaust, pull it out and drop one in, we're seeing those. We're also seeing people go in and say, let's do surgery on the whole body. Let's replace the spine, that rotor. Let's replace the brain, that control. You've already done that. Let's replace all the muscle and ligaments and keep going in the same box. So we're, there's a lot of that activity. Um, and that's why we're on this aftermarket side, as it were, the existing installed base where there's, you know, 5,000 5, units. It's a growing business then. Well, yeah, well, yeah, it's very active, right? Yeah. Much more active right now than the new. <clears throat> yeah. Good? Mr. Chair. Go ahead. So replacing this, this unit, we're looking at $1.1 million, $17 million for a new replacement. Um, so we've got some big cha challenges ahead of us on what direction we take. Do we keep doing what we're doing or do we make that massive investment in just one? So if we were in a hypothetical, replace this brand new system, will it interface with our other systems? Will there be other upgrades down the line with our older systems to, to help that lack of a technological word interface efficient and work well together with everything else we have? Yeah, you want we we just talked about this in the car about about the cradle. Yeah, I, I, you knew I was going to ask this. That's that's why oh, I'm sure. Go ahead. So, Tom mentioned the trailer mounted aero derivative unit LM twenty five hundred. You could park that at Blue Valley and hook up to your transmission system. I mean, it's as is. it's as is. And we you know we use that unit to help. Countries in need do after a natural disaster, we ship some to Haiti. There's a lot running in West Africa. It's yeah. it's an option for quick, uh, efficient power if you need it. I'm looking, talking about long-term replacement. Yeah, well, yeah. that would be considered a long-term replacement, actually. Um, would it? But it's just that it happens to sit on a trailer. And when you do maintenance on an aero derivative, it's like, you know, like I flew here on Delta. So it's like, but Delta's going to drop the engine off and put it, you know. And same thing, you would s potentially swap um, the trailer. Um, so that become that can become an effective method. So that's that's that same thing can be mounted. And we were talking earlier about some of these things fit in the same cradle as the frame fives. So uh, what we're talking about the sixes, the LM6. Yeah. The so LM6, it's a lot bigger. But yeah, we, we've we've done we've we've pulled a frame five off foundation and put a refurbished LM6000, which is slightly larger than the LM2500, it's an aero derivative unit on the same base plate. So yes, it's entirely possible that in the event that H5 or H6 were operational and we could get fast track approval through the Southwest Power Pool, and then yes, you could, you could fit a unit on the same exact foundation as H5 or H6. You've also done the control system on all these units, so technically the control system you put in, however many years ago that was, probably only a few, would be the same control system, so you already have that infrastructure already there. And the control room for those folks are going to look the same. It's just, it's going to look exactly the same. So in theory, could that dollar per megawatt be reduced then because we can use those other Sh parts? Sure. I mean, we, I, I sprung this on him today, so. <laughs> so, um, so to give in fairness, so he he's already looking at a ton of this stuff, so um, so that would be that would be something we would, 
as going forward, we would probably, and we would probably hand that off to another set of guys. Um, I'm only come for the free beer or something. We like but, having the bosses here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, so, um, no, this would be other bosses from the new unit side of the business, yes. Well, the conundrum that we face is it was framed perfectly that we're at this crossroads where we need to figure this out going forward and we need to have the best analysis of what the cost uh, benefit analysis is going to be for yeah. for our rate payers because this is going to be generational yeah uh, for sure yeah. Yeah. so are those those aero units on the trailer are those the quick start deals yes yeah okay. they start in uh, five minutes four minutes yeah four minutes five minutes nine ppm the ones you're running are probably, you don't even measure it, but it's probably at least 120 uh, parts per million on NOx and CO is probably higher. Um, what else? The new ones can run 75% hydrogen if that ever became real. Um, what else can they do? There's a lot of pieces to that, a lot of things to like about it. Um, it's, this messes up your three-year thing if you went after federal money for some of this stuff, and it's there. People are doing things with attaching a battery. You can even put a battery on the back of these frame fives. Um, to, for how you're being used, I'm not sure that makes sense, but there's a lot of, there's a lot of ways to look at um, investment strategy for sure um, with what the world's trying to do right now. Would, would you, uh, for this one time about trailers, that, was that a peaker or? Base. Those are no. Those those. So, LM is uh, the LM machine is the. Um, no, I can't even think what LM is. Land Marine. <laughs> Thank you, Land Marine. So Land Marine. Um, that's what we normally think of. They started truck monitoring, and that's TM. So if you go, if you Google this later on, TM twenty five hundred, you'll see everything I've said, and I've exhausted all my knowledge. You just don't know it. Um, and. Um, but you can go look at what this is. All, all it is is just mounted that way. And we've seen that. We That's not new. We have the big stuff. We have 7Fs in Venezuela mounted on barges, docked, making power. So um, so there's, it's not, it's just a method of how you want to put the footprint down. But to your question, Councilman, they can run either way. You can run them intermittently as what we what we typically think of as peaker units, or, as was pointed out, the, the unit that was built in the 50s, they turn it on and let it run for days and days right. and days. Right, and that's my thing, is that in 1950, they built them. Pretty robust. Probably, uh, yeah, and so yeah. I consider that a, that out there base compared to what we probably get today, but I don't know. I mean, yeah, I haven't well, really. Yeah, right. It's, it's like the, Peak seems like it'd be awful light duty. I mean, if we're going to drop some money, we just might. Well, I mean, if you think about a aircraft engine, they start and stop six times a day. So th these are... These are built based on the aero uh, engineering path. So almost none of the components are start based. They are hours based. So Delta will say, I need to do maintenance on the engine every 50,000 hours, yeah, and they'll yeah. do it. The other, the other thing is the original. Could you talk into the mic? Yep. Thanks. <laughs> I got to note. I got to look right at you <laughs> right. when I do this to remember. I got to be on the mic. Yeah. The 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 thing with when in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. 90s, we were doing maintenance on part of the unit every 8,000 hours, which was every year. That meant you were running 8,000 hours a year, right? 8760 is the math. So we did we did some maintenance at eight, we and we did 8,000, 16,000, and we did a little more maintenance on the third one. It was called the hot gas bath at 24. We'd repeat again, and at 48, we'd do a major. Okay, there's numbers that match the start space numbers too. But what's happened to, to this point is, and everything, aero derivative and, and all, everything, recip, um, heavy duty gas turbines, what's happened is everybody's pretty much now in the 3,200 hours, or 32,000 hour space, four years, which can be a really long time in where people really run units now. So the, the big units, if you, what's the 7F near here? I don't know. The, the units that, are, that were put in some years back, who would you say? Emporia. Emporia. Emporia would be potentially the time between outages then would be on the order of probably eight, at least eight years. And so parts are, in, parts are meant to go longer in terms of that calendar space now. The challenge with those 
numbers of looking at hours for a peaker versus base loaded unit is the terminology is almost anachronistic now. What does that mean? Because units are going up and down, you're starting these units and going and sitting at four megawatts. Well, that was never intended. Everybody thought you were gonna start and go all the way up and come, right? So that's happened to all the units. What we found is, surprised, we surprised ourselves, surprisingly, the gas turbines are turning out to be really robust. And a lot of what we're having to deal with isn't the gas turbine, but all the stuff around it. And it has to go long years. So, what, what do you mean by all the stuff around it? They're the other parts that help it yeah. run and generate power. You Val the valves bring in the fuel there. The okay. the generator. That was a smart Alec comment there. Um, no, but you know the, the but the switch yard things in the switch yard things in um, uh, instruments. Um, uh, the inlet rusting away. I stood in, under an inlet one time in Japan and they asked me if they were gonna have to replace the inlet and I said, I really don't wanna stand under this inlet, right? If, because, because it's been there for 30 years. So, um, you know, you're, you're gonna have those kind of things. It's, the nice thing is that's not the high tech stuff, generally speaking. It's, right, it's, it's mm -hmm. stuff that you go to Home Depot and get, it's not quite, but Supporting almost. stuff. Yeah. All right, so let's say we were going to build 250 megawatts of power here, 300 megawatts of power. Could we get a handful of those things you're talking about? And that would be, I mean, is that like, that's the happening thing now? If you, if you, were, to, if you were to decide to go put in two, 250, 300 megawatts, um, you would end up, in your case, doing your greenfield and starting from scratch. Okay. Right. There, you wouldn't be reusing anything. You'd be missized everywhere. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. For me, gentlemen, I'm sure the rest of us, unless anybody has questions, I, I genuinely really appreciate you coming. Thank you tonight. very yes, much. Yes, thank you. Yeah, thank you for the time. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Thank All you. right. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Okay. Mr. City Manager, City Street. Sweeping update. Yes, um, city st wide street sweeping, um, very mysterious issue. <laughs> I know we get a lot of questions about how many street sweepers we have, uh, why do we do street sweeping, and why do they never go down my street? So uh, Lisa Phelps, our director of municipal services, is here tonight to uh, help bring a little bit of clarity to this operation and hopefully answer some of the common questions that we and I know the council receive about um, the street sweeping operations. feel a little ill-prepared. I didn't bring a team of technical experts to back me up on this, so I apologize ahead of time. Um, as the city manager said, I'm Lisa Phelps, the municipal services director, and um, as you mentioned, we, there are a lot of questions out there, so we thought this would be a good time. If we're getting a lot of questions, you're probably getting a lot of questions, so just wanted to take a quick couple minutes to refresh um, just the program and some operational differences that are a little new um, compared to historic practices. So. Um, with that, I'll just start with resurrecting the street sweeping program was um, kind of a really exciting thing that we got to do that came from combining uh, the old public works and water pollution control departments. Um, that was always kind of one of those tricky things that was operated by one department but funded by another, at least in my time here. So a um, little headbutting has gone on and just um, the focus when it was operated under a public works perspective is obviously street maintenance and beautification. If you're operating from a water pollution and uh, water quality perspective, then you're um, operating in a different manner. And obviously, you don't care about making it pretty. You just want to make the water the best quality you can. Um, so those two things you wouldn't necessarily think um, were at odds with each other, but they actually really were quite often. Um, so if you're looking, again, beautification, what that means is obviously we want to make it pretty. So um, business districts, public spaces would get done on a greater frequency. Um, and some parts of town would never be swept at all. Water quality perspective, you're looking at only curbed streets or only curbs with curb inlets or only things that drain straight to a waterway. Um, so obviously very different set of routes that you might take through town. Um, so several years ago, like I said, the um, stormwater fund began contributing money for the operation of the street sweeping program. 
Um, and that kind of started this debate on the philosophical change on what do we want the program to do. Um, so since we've combined the departments and those funding sources, we're now funding part of it from street sales tax and part of it from stormwater sales tax. So we're trying to get the best of both worlds. And um, so we're funding, for instance, equipment and the dumping fees from stormwater and the staff time and salaries from street sales tax. And that's kind of the split we've gone with. Um, so operationally, like I said, a little different from what we've typically done. Um, and also to the city manager's point of why don't they ever go down our street? Um, as I said, this, this program actually hasn't been done in over a year at all. So we've just picked up over the last five weeks and really started to, to get that going again. Um, so because it hasn't been done in quite some time, it's probably, we estimate, going to take us about nine months to do the entire city loop. Um, but our expectation going forward, and once we get caught up, is that the entire city would take us five to six months to do. So it should gain considerable ground there once we get caught up. Um, so the recently adopted budget, thank you for approving that, gets us lease on two street sweepers. Um, and we've gotten several comments on the one. So we're renting the one, if anybody's seen it, going through town. That's our rental. Um, we were waiting for the budget approval. And we've gotten lots of comments on our little toy sweeper and isn't that cute and all these things. Because um, it's definitely smaller than what people are used to seeing out on the street. Um, but because it's smaller, it does provide some advantages. So it sits on a smaller chassis, which makes it more maneuverable. It allows us to go into areas like Englewood and the square much easier, and it causes less impact to traffic. Um, it can go a little bit faster, which sweepers don't go crazy fast anyway, but um, they're not as nearly as in the way as their historical counterparts. Um, and along with being smaller, even though they're smaller, they have the same size collection bin in them as the larger counterparts that we're used to. So, um, and also on top of having the same size bin, they have compaction capabilities. So we can fit two to three times more in them than we could the old mechanical sweepers. And I say old mechanical because this is an, um, an air system instead of a mechanical system. So it has um, fewer wear items. It has less hydraulic systems, less brooms that need to be replaced, which all translate, of course, to lower operation and maintenance costs, yay, um, and less downtime for repairs. Um, also, they have better road contact. Because they have an air-controlled broom system, they provide a more consistent spacing with the street. Um, which doesn't put as much pressure on the brooms, hence no pressure, they don't have to be replaced as often. Um, they also, this system comes standard um, with a front articulating system, which you can actually see in the pictures um, behind me, to clear the, um, the weeds and the deep debris in the street that was an expensive upgrade on the trucks that everyone's used to seeing in town, but a standard feature on the one we went ahead and leased are going to lease when it comes to you for approval soon. Um, and along with the benefits, this is a more economical and efficient sweeper. So um, everybody likes it to be less expensive, and it is. Um, when we did a trial run of this sweeper versus the standard sweeper that everybody's used to, this cleaned in one to two passes, what it took the old truck seven to eight passes to clean, and that truck was full before it finished the job. So definite efficiency gains here. Um, and as you can see just from these pictures, the, the two on the left there, obviously before the sweeping's done, and then the one on the right after the truck's gone through, um, getting this program up and running definitely makes appear huge appearance um, improvements and improvements to the perception of our city overall. And also gives us the added benefit of improving water quality while we're at it. So we're all really excited to get those new sweepers in here. Um, and just to get the program operational again, just random stat in the last five weeks um, with the rented sweeper, we've cleared 154 miles of town and that's uh, picked up about 22 fully loaded dump trucks worth of debris. So if you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Otherwise, that's yeah. just the um, update. I was wondering, are you going to be able to get an off-road model? I wish. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I get to drive it first. <laughs> number two, how does this thing go over the, the, all these steel plates? Is that an issue? Um, it's going over them fine. The, um, the air system to keep that spacing is helpful, but um, they go so slow 
anyway, that it's not really causing an issue so far. So hopefully that keeps up. Mayor Pro Tem, go ahead. So what, talk a little bit about the debris that you have and how you deal with that, because that brings up its own permitting issues and It does, which is too. part of why the program was shut down right. for the length of time that it was. Um, there were some issues um, with the old dumping system. And so basically what we're gonna have to do now is dump as we go. So um, we're going to, at the end of the day, once or twice a day max, have to make a run to dump the sweepings to the landfill. Um, if we hold them on site in containers, then we have to get permitting to be a transfer station for solid waste, and that's a whole not, you know, another mess in and of itself. So if we just dump as we go and pay those fees, it's a more economical way for us to deal with that, and it keeps us out of any regulatory issues. Right, it, it, everything's regulated, you boy. <laughs> So I tell you, but absolutely. <laughs> yep. Well, thank you for your info. I have one question. Sure. I, just um, when Councilmember Huff talked about um, uh, the steel plates, we have a lot of them in this city right now. Yes, Will you keep us informed? I mean, I I worry about the damage it'll do to the, the brooms, the blades, whatever. Um, if if you see an increase in uh, issues related to those areas. Would you keep us informed on that? I mean, those are Absolutely. actions that we would need to make sure we're, we figure out how to communicate that out to Spire and, and uh, who's gonna pay for that. Sure, and um, just for your information um, and kind of in keeping with your comment last Monday night about um, we can't control where the other utilities go, that is true, but we're trying to look at what we can control on the back end for restoration and just what other cities are doing and it, anyone that's doing it better. So I've asked our right-of-way supervisor to go and shadow a couple of other places just to see if they have ordinances on the back end that force better um, newer practice of cleanup or restoration and things like that. Where the streets are in I'm not picking on our streets because I know they're pristine, but <laughs> I'm kidding, of course. But where, where, there, where we have broken curbs, those kind of things, are, uh, is that something that is potentially uh, damaging to any of the, the components in, in the sweeper? Um, again, they go really slow, like sub 10 miles an hour. So, so they're picking up gravel and whatnot. They are, <laughs> um, but again, not having as many um, moving pieces, let's say that. Um, mm -hmm there isn't as much wear and tear on them. But that is another reason that we did want to opt to um, lease instead of purchase them, mm -hmm. because general fund, as we know, has historically been plagued with budget issues. And what had happened, I think, in the past, part of the problem was um, we bought the sweepers, but we'd get to a point where we couldn't necessarily maintain them and then had no point, no choice but to just let them sit idle for a while until we found the money and we are just kind of having them limp along. This forces us into a position where we may, we keep upgrading that equipment and we keep having equipment that works so we can stay on top of the program. I'm just worried more about how we balance, you know, like curb conditions with our equipment sure. and, you know, the cost to repair and maintain equipment that mm -hmm. is damaged by broken curbs and whatnot. Would it be cheaper just to Do replace curbs <laughs> and, and make sure that, you know, when we go down, we have a, a surface that's not damaging equipment Agreed. Yeah, I, I appreciate it. Thank you. No problem. Anyone else? else? All right. Thank you, Lisa. Appreciate Thanks. it. Our next presentation, Mr. City Manager. Yes, sir. Mr. Mayor Pro Tem and members of the council, uh, final staff presentation tonight. Last week, the council had first reading of an ordinance that has been worked on and recommended by the Human Relations Commission. I know there were some questions about that, so we asked a representative of the Human Relations Commission, Thad McCullough, to come tonight uh, and address uh, that proposed ordinance before you have your second and final reading next week. Uh, I know we have other members of the commission here tonight as well, but um, I believe Mr. McCullough is going to speak to this specific issue, so I will turn it over to him. Thank you. Hello, council. All right. Um, where I believe this is, is um, legal is looking at the proposed ordinance. So there, if there's specific questions about that, I think that legal would have those answers. I'm here basically giving a statement on behalf of the Human Relations Commission. 
Um, conversion therapy refers to any of several dangerous and discredited practices aimed at challenging an individual sexual orientation or gender identity. Such practices have been rejected by every med, uh, mainstream medical and mental health organization for decades, but due to continuing discrimination and social bias against LGBTQ people, some practitioners continue to conduct conversion therapy. Minors are especially vulnerable, and conversion therapy can lead to depression, anxiety, drug use, homelessness, and suicide. The American Academy of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry find no evidence to support the application of any therapeutic intervention, operating under the premise that a specific sexual orientation, gender identity, and or gender expression is pathological. Furthermore, based on the scientific evidence that the AACAP asserts that such conversion therapies lack scientific credibility and clinical unity. Additionally, there is evidence that such interventions are harmful. As a result of conversion therapies, as a result, conversion therapy should not be a part of any behavioral health treatment of children and adolescents. To date, California, Colorado, Connecticut, Delaware, Hawaii, Illinois, Maine, Maryland, Massachusetts, Nevada, New Hampshire, New Jersey, New Mexico, New York, Oregon, Rhode Island, Utah, Virginia, Vermont, Washington, the District of Columbia, and Puerto Rico all have laws of regulations protecting youth from this harmful practice. A growing number of municipalities have also enacted similar protections, including at least 70 cities and counties in Arizona, Colorado, Florida, Georgia, Iowa, Kentucky, Michigan, Minnesota, Missouri, New York, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Washington, and Wisconsin. We, the members of the Human Relations Commission, recommend that the Council move forward in adopting a conversion therapy ban to add Independence's name to this growing list. Let us come together and make Independence a safer community for the LGBTQ plus community youth. Thank you. Is there any questions? Briefly. Thank you, Mr. Mayor Pro Tem. Um, do you know who in Missouri has this? Kansas City does. Um, Kansas City, Columbia yeah. uh -huh. are, are the two off the top of my head that I'm aware of. We're sometimes a little slow to adopt more progressive things in Missouri. Councilmember so. Hobart, St. Louis has one as well. Do they? Okay. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Langford. Um, well, I appreciate you bringing this forward uh, before us, and um, uh, I appreciate the time your committee put into this. So thank you very much. Thank you. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Appreciate it. That brings us to staff reports. We have a few boards and commissions that we're looking to add resolutions to the next council meeting. First, the Sustainability Commission recommendation has been made to appoint Anthony Summer. If there's no objection, we'll add a resolution to the next meeting. There are none. Okay. Next, the Slovak Sister City Committee recommendation has been made to appoint Grace Cohan and John Saturo. If there's no objections, we will add a resolution to the next meeting. There are none. Next is TIF Commission. The Council and Review Committee has made a recommendation to appoint John Tesoro, I can't say that, Satoro, Satoro, Satoro <laughs> to the uh, TIF Commission. If there's no objections, we'll add a resolution to the next meeting. Okay, next is the Independence Economic Development Council. Recommendations been made to appoint Mayor Eileen Weir. If there's no objection, we'll add a resolution to the next agenda. No objections. And finally is the Tree Commission. Um, this is an individual appointment for Mayor Weir, and she's recommending reappointing David Campbell. If there's no objection, we'll add a resolution to the next agenda. No objections. Thank you. That uh, brings us to an end. Any uh, things from the council? Mr. City Manager. I have nothing further. Thank you. Meeting adjourned.